I would say that nature, being outside, has always been a part of my life. And because of that, it's a very important feature in most of the books that I work on, that I illustrate and write. I was lucky enough to grow up on a farm, a dairy farm, right here in beautiful little Virginia. And being outside was a big part of our day. In fact, we felt guilty when we were inside. So we'd go outside and we'd explore the fields and the woods. We'd uh, check things out at the pond or down at the creek. And there was always stuff to look at. There was always an insect, an interesting insect, or a fox, an uh, interesting bird. Um, always something to find on the farm. So exploring the farm was a great thing. I, I feel so lucky that that was part of my up upbringing. I remember that one of the f best presents I ever got was a field guide to the birds. And it had a, a, a record that came with it of bird songs to Eastern North America. Oh my gosh, I played that thing over and over. I think it wore, I wore it flat. But now, when I'm outside, because I had that experience, like right now I can hear an indigo bunting, I can hear a cardinal, I hear a wood thrush. I'm hearing all these birds out in the woods and around my yard here because I explored and listened and paid attention to what was outside when I was growing up. I think that was an important part of my childhood. When I'm illustrating a, a page for a book, sometimes I'll have the words, and I'll read the words many, many times. I'll get an image in my head, and the one that really stands out is the one that I try to, try to illustrate. Now, I've got lots of things to think about. I've got the gutter of the page, you know, where, the, where the pages come together and they're sewn or glued or, or stitched together. I've got to be careful there. And then I've got to think about how the picture flows across the page. Does it make you want to turn the page and go on through the story? So there are lots of things to think about. And I've got to illustrate what the words are, are telling you. Now in a, in a wordless picture book, boy, that's a whole different thing because there are no words. Hey, I don't have to leave space for the words somewhere on the, on the page, so that's great. But I've got to convey a whole different thing. I've got to, I've got to tell the, the whole story in a picture because there aren't any words to help you. Now, in this page, for example, I, I, I started with a cream-colored paper. I thought that would be a great idea to kind of have an, an aged, more old-timey look to it. So I chose a cream, antique kind of paper. And then I got my favorite tool of all, a good old pencil. And for these illustrations, I chose either a 2B or a 3B or a 4B pencil, a softer lead pencil, so I could make soft sort of little, little marks. I thought that would be the best thing to do for this particular book because it's kind of a soft, somber story, and I didn't want any bright colors, no bright reds or greens or blues, but just kind of a soft, somber, moody sort of feel. That's why I chose the kind of cream colored paper and a soft sort of pencil. It's so great choosing the media to kind of help you express what you're trying to show in the, in the pictures and in the story. You know, sometimes kids ask me, any advice I like to draw? Any advice that you can give me? And I say, yeah, get a pet. I think that's really, really a great advantage if you have a pet. Man, I had cats and dogs and cows and chickens, frogs. I mean, I had all the kinds of pets. If you've got a pet and you watch that pet, you're observing the pet all the time, then you're watching how they move, the way their arms and legs and feet and ears, all those things and how they connect and how they move and how, they, um, how the animal sits and, and, and lays down, looks up. If you're watching all those things, it'll help you draw them. I'm constantly 
remembering animals that I've known and, and drawing them on paper. It's sort of like if you are put in a foreign country and you don't speak the language and suddenly you're just hearing this language all the time, you're going to pick it up. You're going to start learning the language. And the same thing is true if you've got an animal, you've got a dog that walks across the room and you're watching that dog walk across the room. In your head, you're getting the way that that animal moves. And that's in there, oh my gosh, it'll make it so much easier to draw that later. I'm not a formally trained artist. Um, I guess you'd call me a self-taught artist. I actually studied forestry at Virginia Tech. I was so interested in um, animals, plants, forests, soil, dirt, rocks, clouds. I went to Virginia Tech and, and studied all those things. I took ornithology, dendrology, ichthyology, plant morphology, aquatic entomology, all the ologies. So now they're all here. When I get a manuscript for a story that has a ladybird beetle in it, or a grasshopper, or a bat, then, oh my gosh, I'm drawing on all sorts of information that's already stored in my head. So it's very immediate to me. I can draw on that information. Unless I've got something like a great striped crested sapsucker from another country that I have to do a little research about that, then I have to explore and look up that source. But otherwise, the things that are here in North America and the United States, I've got a good background for that information. So uh, that's been a lucky thing for me. That's why I think maybe a lot of my books have a natural history uh, a content to them.